Um, Salam Subrahia. So the reading is taken from Philippians, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the spirit for the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning and a very happy new year to everyone. Have you ever, ever caught a glimpse of yourself in the mirror, stopped, looked, and thought, how did I get here? And then look back at the life that you've lived up until that point. Anyone ever done that? Yeah? Yeah, I have. I did it when we were down with our oldest daughter and my grandson. And I took a look at her when I was driving her home from work and thought, how is she a mum? Where did the years go that got her to this age and she's a mum? And I got into the house and I looked at my wife and thought, I met you when I was 15. How the heck have we got here? And then you look at this young man and then you start to look forward. And you think, it's not written yet. I don't know the future. I don't know what this holds for you, young man. And then you start to wonder, will I be around? What advice can I give him? How can I be of use to him? And then this is kind of what I think happens in a new year. We stop, we look back, and then we look forward. And we look back and try and make connections, don't we? I bought a book over Christmas. From, uh, it's on the year 1962 to 65. The reason I bought it is my mum and dad married in 64. And I wanted to read what it was like for them when they got married. What was the political machinations then? What was the issues they were dealing with? Like we've got an election coming up this year. We know in America there's a presidential election and everyone's panicking that the Donald might win. What was happening to them when they got married? 62 was the Cuban Missile Crisis, 63 the other, but I could go on and on. What I'm trying to say is this time in a year is when we look back and we look forward. And then when we come to this scripture, we cannot but look back because this was written two and odd thousand years ago to a people very much like us, but very different from us. Remember there's, an old, there's a song called I Wish I Was a Punk Rocker with Flowers in My Hair. Has anyone heard that song? Yeah, in 77 and 69, revolution was in the air. And she says, the only way to stay in touch was a letter in the mail. And this is what you've got here with Paul. This is a letter in the mail. This is him looking back and then looking forward. It's him talking to a church he founded, a church he loves, where he is not the vicar or the pastor because he travels around. But he has no internet. He has no FaceTime. As an aside... As we look at the future, child psychologists and educational theorists are starting to say they're very worried about the young people of today because social media is reorganizing their brains in a ways that they do not know the effects of yet. But they're beginning to see things like you and I in a letter, we wouldn't say things to people's faces that they say now on social media. 
when you and I got home, I've said this before, if there was a bully, we could ignore them. You can't ignore them when they're on your screen in front of your face. So there is a society asking, what does the future hold? What's AI going to mean for our employment? What's AI going to mean for the rest of our lives when everything's an app and everything follows us and everything we know? So you put something online and it never goes away. So we as a nation are looking forward at that. This is what Paul's saying to this church. Why am I bringing this up? Because I want to say, like Sarah, at the beginning of the year, as a church, we've looked back. And it's been a painful year. Because we've buried many people that we loved that were a major part of our church's life. And yet here we are on the cusp of a new year that's yet unwritten. And Paul, Sally, would you put up the, the pictures for me? This is ancient Philippi. This, this is part of ancient Philippi. The people whom this was written to, that's where they lived. That's their forum. It says, I've written this down, it says, well, I got this from the New Testament records a visit to this city of the Apostle during his second missionary journey, about 40 to 50. On the basis of the Acts of the Apostles and this letter to the early Christians concluded that Paul founded this church community. So you can read the history of the New Testament and find this community was founded by Paul. Now, it didn't look like this. Now, when they lived in it, I doubt they ever thought it could look like this. But we know it does because the Roman Empire collapsed. So he says he was accompanied by Silas and possibly by Timothy and even for those Christians who've read this by Luke, the doctor. They all went to this city. So Paul is believed to have preached here for the first time on European soil. It's the first time he left the Middle East and entered onto a journey into Europe and he preached the gospel in this place. You can see the forum. If you look on the picture to your very right below, that's the forum. And if you get involved in the home groups, the first video of Discipleship Explored, he stands in that forum. In that very, uh, he stands right on the, in the middle there and looks around and tries to do, I guess, what I'm trying to do. He's get my head around what was it like for them then. What were they facing? What were they living through? What was their looking back at their life? And what were they looking forward to in the future? That's why I picked up what I bought for Christmas. Because I know I can't step back into 62, nor can we there but we can ask a few questions about what is this letter. And I want to say it's a love letter from Paul to the church. And we've just finished 1 Corinthians 13, which was all about love. We've journeyed together asking, again, what does our society say love is? How do they define it? What do they believe that love actually is? And what does the scripture teach us how to love? What does God, the God we serve, say through his scripture? This is love. And we've looked at persevering. We've looked at keeping going, which I'm going to come to. We've looked at the idea that love is an action, that you can help someone to achieve something that they can't help themselves. It's not an emotion that comes and goes. So let's look at what Paul says to this church, very briefly. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. So he's calling them to mind. Again, the only way of staying in touch is a letter in the mail. So he doesn't know. He's founded them. He loves them. He wants to know how they are. And there's the point of home groups, like Sarah said, number one, is people will know how you are. Remember Cheers? Everyone wants to go, but everyone knows your name. They're always glad you came, and then they notice when you're not there. And it's also a place, a home group, where you can tell your story, where you can look back on your life that brought you to this point, and an environment where you can share it like a dressing room, it stays there. So he remembers them, he calls them to mind, he thinks about them, he cares about them. Next one slide, please. Sally, keep going. In all my prayers for all of you, I pray with joy. So he's always praying for them. He remembers them. He loves them. And then this word joy, it's a deep Hebrew and Greek word. It's not a passing fad. It's not like happiness that comes and goes. Do you see that on the news where the gentleman jumped in to get the judge in America and he said he hit her because he was having a bad day? It's not that. Joy is a deep-seated thing which Jess picked up on on our last sermon in Corinthians. The perseverance of knowing what we believe brings the joy. It's a security that wraps around us that this God is who he says he is. And he is going to keep the promises he makes or Paul loves them. He prays for them by remembering them. And he wants them to pray and he prays with joy for them. Because of your partnership in the gospel. So he's saying to them, look, you've been partners with me. And this is another thing that I hope our home groups do. We are partners in the gospel together. 
I'm sorry, it's not all my job. It's not, it, it's not the thing to suddenly say, ah, oh, here's the vicar, he'll do it, he'll answer all your questions. They are partners with him. He loves them as I love you. He prays for them as I pray for you. He longs for them as I long for you. And at the start of this year, based on this reading and where we're going, what do I long for? What is the vision I hold? To grow in depth and to grow in numbers. The depth is what I'm dealing with today. So he prays for them for the first day. They've been partners with him. They've journeyed with him. They've seen it all. They've seen death. They've seen arrest. Paul is arrested. He's in a Roman house arrest when he writes this. So they've seen it. They've walked it. They've known it. They've been pressured to give up. They've stood in that forum and heard, oh, Jesus. Isn't... And the pressure to give, they've heard it. They've seen it. Next one, please, Sally. But he's confident of this. This is my favorite verse of the whole and entire scripture. He who began a good work. He, the Lord, it's his responsibility. He began this good work in you. He will be faithful. He'll carry it on to completion. Now then, Jess said it, and here's my favorite phrase in church. And then we're ready for this. Go on, go on doing it. We have no English equivalent of the present perfect. Go on, go on. That's what Paul's saying. You've been my partners. You've gone on going on. And in this work, go on going on. Because he will complete it in you. He'll challenge you. He'll change you. There'll be times when, like Sarah said, you'll think you're already grasping by your fingertips. But that's when. I'll come to it in a minute. So that he'll can carry this on until completion, until the day of Jesus Christ. Next one, please. Then he says, it's right for me to feel this way since I have you in my heart. Do you see, this is 1 Corinthians 13. Paul's living this out. I have you in my heart as I have you. I long for you to grow in depth. So to go on, go on being. That together we are partners in this gospel. And that as we journey through 2024, in a way like Emmaus, Jesus walks with them and he explains the scriptures. They're downhearted. And then they recognize him when he takes them in. That's what I, I long for. That together we are partners and Jesus walks along and we explain the scriptures. And we marinate, that's the phrase I've used, like you get your chicken at Christmas or turkey and you marinate a juice. That it will marinate through us and become something we love to discuss. Because I could talk to you about history for ages, I could tell you all about Philippi. I got lost in the history of it. Because what I'm trying to say is I'd love to step into 64 and see what it was like. And what's it like for us? What are we facing? What's our pressures? How do we handle it? How are we disciples in our age? And I think we've much to learn from what Paul writes to them. They only had a letter in the mail. They didn't have technology. But he has them in the heart. And whether I'm in chains, defending it, all of you sharing God's grace with me. We're all in this, to use a phrase, together. We're journeying together. And what I've heard here... And what I heard in Emmanuel, and when I was in Rams Bottom 2, is this. Oh, I'm too thick to do this. I've not been to college. I've not been to university. I can't speak Hebrew. I never want to hear that. Because I want to say to you, with all the force I've got of my office, that is utter drivel. Yes, you can do it. You don't need a degree in Hebrew or a doctorate in ancient Greek. All you need is to want to know the scriptures better. To bring those questions to the home group. Because I suppose no one's going to put the hand up of Rob might and interview my sermon with a question. Or there he goes, he's doing it now. Um, you don't often do that. But there, I hope, is where you can say, I've got a question. And please don't ever say, oh, it's a stupid question. No, it's not. No question's ever stupid. And the home group is where you should feel like a dressing room. You can ask whatever you want. And then, yes, if there is a problem and the answer's not found, someone can say, I'll ask, I'll go and find out. That's what I hope this, what's what Sarah and I is trying to do is go on, go on doing this. Go on being shaped. Go on marinating in this scripture so that the world out there will ask, who's seeking happiness, who's seeking answers, what is this joy you've got? Why do you have it when there's bombs falling and Ukraine is at war? What, why? And then we can say why. So they're with him, they're defending it. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And when I was appointed here, Sally will tell you, that's what my longing was. That we will grow ever more in depth of our, coming to this word in a minute, of love of God, but in numbers as we reach out there. For what else is the effort all for? What's the effort for? 
and I was brought front and centre at Christingle when someone said to me, thank you for this, this is my Christmas now, and I tried to hint about other Christmas services, no, 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 this is all I need. And I thought, why? What are you searching for? What is it about Christmas that drew you in here? But what is it about the rest that you want no part of? And how do I meet you? How do I invite you? How do I get you to see the stories that we have that have brought us here? Next slide, please. This bit. And this is my prayer. This is my prayer, says Paul to them and mine to you. That your love, having one Corinthians in mind of what God says our love is, may abound. That's to keep growing, to bounce up, to get more and more. Here you go. In knowledge and depth of insight. That ain't Hebrew word, knowledge. The idea of what we understand. And again, let me repeat, please don't ever say to me, but I've not got a degree. You don't need one. You just need desire and an open heart and a need to go on, go on doing this. And you will grow and you will change and it will be painful. And there may, may be times when you think, oh, keep going like Jess said in her sermon, perseverance produces faith. Perseverance, keep going. So we make jolly depths of insight next. So that you may be able to discern. And there you go. In our modern world, we must discern. There are so many voices. The 5-2 diet, this way, that way. The Christmas bestseller book of how to have this life. and how to, They're everywhere. And yet we're told as Christians, this is the book we follow. And in depth of knowledge and insight, we will gain discernment of what is best. Of way to live. Of how to love. Of how to serve the community. Of how to be the church of Jesus Christ. Deep in joy. I've nearly finished. Then he says, pure and blameless, filled with the fruit of righteousness. Do you see, that's what I'm saying. Perseverance brings joy. Joy brings the fruit. How does the fruit come? By go on, go on doing it. By marrying it, by being together, like Sarah said, encouraging one another. So if you're ill and you're not there, they notice. If something happens, they pray with you. And you are also able then, like Sarah said, how do you not know that you might bring something to that group? A word, a statement. You may have walked a road that you can help someone else with. And then we go on, go on being partners in this gospel. So that's why Sarah and I issued the challenge. That's why Sally and I spent ages trying to find the right material. Because some of it assumes you, Jane and Freddie, Jesus was a nice boy. And I, I thought, no, don't, we want something that's going to challenge you, but not patronise you. Because I hate, one of the things I loathe, because we were parents very young, is being patronised. And we were patronised. And I loathe the idea that I'll patronise you. I never, ever want to do that. I want to challenge and encourage you. If you're not in a home group, think about one. That you may share and be encouraged and marinade in this gospel. Because you may have something to share with someone else who may need it at that moment. And you do not know what God will do with it. I finish there. This is why I've laid the foundation. And what happens now is in the next times the preachers will preach from Philippians and from another verse so that all the home groups can go together, journey together. Like Sarah said, it's not forever, it's only eight weeks. Look back on the sermon, look again at what Paul is saying. That in 2024, All Saints Anchors Home has come through the valley of the shadow of death in 23. And I hope that this year can be one. We will remember, of course we will. But when we hold on to that promise of this joy, and I say to you, honestly, excuse me, <clears throat> that I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I pray with joy. I truly do. It is a privilege to be the vicar here. And I pray for you with joy because I long for you to grow in the depth and the knowledge of insight. I long for us to be that church that lives out 1 Corinthians 13 and that we are partners together in the gospel. I leave it there. So please journey with us now for these next few weeks through this lovely, lovely book, through this book of love, through the people who were the Philippians, who could send us, and I, I finish with, I wondered what they would write to us as a letter in the mail now. If we could bring them back, what would they write to us in 2024 from where they stood? And would we recognise their challenges Let's pray. Lord, we stand on this cusp of a new year. And so, this isn't written for us. We don't know what the world future holds. We do know where we've come from. 
We do know what's happened to us, what shaped us, what's made us angry, what's made us hurt. For some, what's closed us off because we're so hurt we want to push over there. And I ask, Lord, like a flower in spring, you would open us to receive from your hand that this year we will go on, go on, persevering, that we will find that love is patient and kind, that it does not envy and it does not boast, that it keeps no record of wrongs, always hopes, rejoices with the truth, always perseveres, that this church may be just that and that we may grow in the depth and the knowledge and insight of this book, of you, and of one another, for we are partners in the gospel. Amen. Sarah, thank you.